This faith and finance podcast is underwritten in part by One Ascent. God has created every single person and every square inch with immeasurable dignity. And every day, businesses impact these people and places in powerful ways, either causing them harm or helping them flourish. Our trusted sponsor, One Ascent, exists to help investors consider who a business impacts and how they're impacted. More than likely, your values inspire why you invest, whether it's to provide for your family, put your kids through college, or prepare for the next stage of life. One Ascent believes your values can also inspire how you invest by directing your investment capital into companies that positively impact the world. Whether you invest on your own or work with an advisor, One Ascent's comprehensive values aligned solutions seek to help you do well by doing good. To explore a new way of investing that aligns with your values, visit oneascent.com. Click on Analyze My Investments on the homepage to tailor your portfolio to what truly matters to you. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it will be measured back to you. Luke 638. I am Rob West. God makes certain promises about giving to encourage us to be generous, to trust Him, and not fear. Art Rayner is with us today to talk about the power of these promises. Then we'll take your calls at 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. This is Faith and Finance, biblical wisdom for your financial journey. Well, our guest, Art Rayner, is the author of the brand new book, Money in the Light of Eternity, What the Bible Says About Your Financial Purpose. He's also a frequent contributor here at FaithFi and a good friend. Art, welcome back. Rob, it is always an honor. Thanks for having me again. Absolutely. And Art, Money in the Light of Eternity is so deep and yet so easy to read. It reminds me of something Larry Burkett used to say, that every spending decision is a spiritual decision. Would you agree with that idea? I would. I'm I'm reminded of a couple of things when you ask that question. First, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Bible makes it clear money management reflects heart management. Second, The Bible is obviously not silent on the topic of money. There are over 2,000 verses about it. So as believers, the question is whether we trust what God says regarding his promises and provision, and are we willing to surrender this area of our lives to him? Mm, That's a powerful idea, one we all need to consider. Well, as you know, Art, we're going to dig into one of your chapters around giving. It's titled Giving as an Act of Trust, and you unpack God's promises about giving. So I want to go over those, the first of which is God promises he will provide. Yeah, let's look at Malachi 3.10. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Mm -hmm. Try it. Put me to the test. Mm -hmm. See, God doesn't tell us to give and then leaves us hanging. No, he ties a promise to our generosity. He promises to pour out an abundance of blessings on us, and he tells us to test him in this to give him the opportunity to show that he will make good on his promise. Now, does this mean that giving generously to the church will finally get you that new red Lamborghini that you've always dreamed of? (laughs) Right. Not necessarily. God's blessings can be financial and material, but they can also be spiritual. Maybe God gives you the contentment you have been chasing for years, the same contentment you once sought for money by becoming part of something far more significant than your own momentary life on earth. Yeah, that's a powerful invitation the Lord gives us. All right, this next promise that you unpack is that God promises he will multiply. Yeah, right. In John 6, Jesus turns a small boy's five loaves and two fish into enough to feed 5,000 with 12 baskets full left over. Many of us can relate to this boy. We look at our meager resources and wonder what God could ever do with them in the face of such great need. What difference can our generosity make? John 6 shows us that God is a God of multiplication. God will take whatever you give and multiply your resources to accomplish his purposes. That is a promise from God, but it takes trust. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. All right, I think we have time for one more. I'd love for you to explain the promise that God will enrich. We all enjoy getting a good return on our investments, or ROI. You like a good ROI, I like a good ROI, and so does God. Therefore, God promises to enrich those who give. In 2 Corinthians 9-11, Paul writes to those who trust God with their money, Yes, you will be enriched in every way, so that you can always be generous. You see, God wants a good ROI. He gives so that we can give. He blesses so that we can bless others. God is looking for conduits of generosity, channels through which His blessings can flow. He is looking for men and women whom He can enrich so that others may be blessed. Yeah, and that's our incredible opportunity as stewards of God's resources. All right, so we've got just a few seconds left. Tie a bow on this for us, Art. Generosity is an act of trust. It, It shifts our hearts from reliance on ourselves and money to reliance on God. Generous giving visibly demonstrates our trust in God and His promises to provide. If you are a Christian, you already have trusted God with your soul. It's time that you trust Him with your money. Wow, that's a powerful idea and a great place for us to finish today. Art, thanks for stopping by, my friend. Thanks for having me. That's Faith Fi contributor Art Rayner. Pick up a copy of his new book, Money in the Light of Eternity, what the Bible says about your financial purpose. Back with your questions after this. Stick around. We are grateful for support from One Ascent Investments on the Faith and Finance program. They manage a comprehensive suite of value-based investment strategies designed to help Christian investors live aligned with what they value most. One Ascent believes that if your values inspire the way you live, they should also inspire the way you invest. This can be a unique form of worship. More information is available at investments.oneascent.com. That web address is investments.oneascent.com. As a faithful listener of this program, you know that there's life-changing financial wisdom in God's Word. And FaithFi is here to help you and millions of others learn to be good and faithful stewards. As a nonprofit organization, we rely on help from monthly FaithFi patrons, supporters of this mission, to help us continue and expand our outreach. Has God provided financial answers for you through this ministry? If so, consider becoming a monthly FaithFi patron. Visit FaithFi.com and click Give. Welcome back to Faith and Finance. I'm Rob West. All right, it's time for your calls and questions today. 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. You can call right now. Uh, Let's go to Montana and uh, begin with Nicholas today. Go ahead, sir. Hey, thanks for taking my call today. Sure. Yeah, and uh, I was just uh, curious. I uh, have an outstanding balance on a credit card, and I was just wondering if the there's any pros and cons, they gave me a settlement offer that's significantly less than the balance owed, either a one-time or a 12-month or a uh, 24-month type of payment. And I was wondering if there's stuff to watch out for when they do that. Yeah. So is this the actual creditor that's offering this to you, or has it been sold to a collection agency? It's the actual creditor. Okay. And are they offering just to give you a payment plan, or are they actually reducing the balance? Reducing the balance. Okay. Yeah. So debt settlement, uh, getting a forgiveness uh, of a portion of that uh, in exchange for a partial payment uh, can ease financial burden. So, I mean, it's certainly helpful if you're in a difficult spot, but it does impact your credit. It will hurt your credit score. Not only is it a part of the credit scoring algorithm, the fact that you settled the debt for less than the outstanding balance, um, but it will be notated on the account that it was settled in full. Uh, there on the credit report. Now, it will show as a zero balance and all things being equal, it's important to get these paid off. And, you know, if you had the option to either just leave it outstanding because you couldn't pay it or to pay it, settle it in full, I would choose the settled in full option. But you do have to recognize there is going to be, um, you know, an impact on your credit score. So despite the potential downside, you know, I like the idea of you making that partial repayment and getting it to zero better than leaving it unpaid. But if you had the ability to pay it in full, I think, you know, honoring your obligations and protecting your credit is a better way to go. Does that make sense? Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And then how long does that usually impact a credit score for? 
Yeah, it, uh, you know, there's no way to know, um, you know, it, it, as, you know, the longer something is in the past, the less it impacts you. So over time, it will gradually come back up, especially if you have other accounts, uh, you know, that are in good standing and that are being repaid, you know, monthly on time. So you're being shown as an on-time payer. Uh, that most recent information is going to impact you the most. So it just widely, there's such a wide disparity between how quickly it will come back. And a lot of that's going to have to do with how much good credit you actually have. So for instance, uh, you know, part of your credit score is your credit mix. Do you have installment accounts and revolving accounts? Uh, that are all active and, you know, being paid on time. Uh, what does your credit utilization look like for your active accounts? Is your total utilization below 30% of the available credit? Uh, you know, how much history do you have? Was there one settlement or multiple settlements? So the bottom line is, again, let's get those to zero. I'd prefer you pay them in full. If you settled them in full, that's better than leaving them unpaid. It's going to bring it down. But I think, you know, 12 months from now, you'll probably be back where you were before all of this happened, certainly 24 months from now, so long as you have other good credit that's replacing this negative information. Okay, that makes sense. I appreciate it. Absolutely, Nicholas. Thanks for your call today. God bless you, sir. Uh, 800-525-7000 is the number to call. We've got some lines open today. We'd love to hear from you. Again, 800 525 Seven thousand. You can call right now. Uh, let's go to uh, Pflugerville, Texas. Hi, Ray. Go ahead, sir. Hi, Rob. Thank you for tele- taking my call. Um, uh, the question that I'm having is, I um, had a a, a little uh, phone talk conference with a, a Fidelity representative earlier today, yeah. and he came, he asked me about. Uh, he was asking me, uh, one of the questions he asked me was uh, uh, about this, uh, I have like $50,000 in a savings account. And he asked me if I would consider putting that in a high yield account. And I said, well, you know, I've been thinking about doing that because uh, I've heard it on this radio station that I listen to. And uh, and the, he was telling me that Fidelity offers a, uh, a brokerage account. That That's the same thing. Uh, and he, he called it a money market account. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I didn't know if that was the same thing as a high yield, uh, um, uh, or they also offer this other account called cash management account. Yeah. And the challenge is you, I want you to use something that has FDIC insurance. Um, so yes, a money market account is, uh, very much like a high yield savings account. And usually if it's a money market account, not a money market mutual fund, you will often have that FDIC insurance, but that's a question you would want to ask, uh, the person at fidelity. Uh, and then you could go compare that to other options at bankrate.com. So for instance, you know, if you wanted to get a CD right now, you could get, you know, almost 6%, uh, depending on which online bank you use. Um, if you're looking for high yield uh, savings, you know, there's some great options there for that as well. I think the highest you're going to find right now is just just north of 5% with a five-star rated online bank with FDIC insurance, probably 5.05, I think is the best I've seen. And then if you go to a certificate of deposit and you're willing to lock it up, let's say for a year, um, you know, right now you could find, uh, you know, perhaps as much as even 550, 5.5. So, you know, I think that's your next step is, is really to compare the alternatives. And then secondly, to ask him on this money market account if there's FDIC insurance. And if so, then I would say you could consider that alongside the other options. Okay. Well, thank you, Rob, for that, uh, for that uh, info, that, uh, that advice. Thank you, sir. All right. You're welcome, Ray. We appreciate your call today, sir. God bless you. Louise is in Chicago. Hi there. Hi, Rob. Um, thanks for taking my call and yeah. uh, for your ministry. Very grateful. Thank you. Hey, um, so um, my question was, um, I took out on a loan on a, for my 401k. Uh, that loan is paid for. It's it's um, it's paid in full. Um, uh, but I, uh, I pay some interest uh, to it. My question is, who does that interest go to? I mean, am I, is, does it go into my funds or it goes somewhere else? 
Yeah, it's a great question, uh, Lewis. The, you benefited from the interest you paid on your 401k loan. So essentially, you took the money out of uh, one of your pockets and you put it into another. Uh, now, the plan administrator may have charged a 50 or $100 origination fee for processing the loan, but that uh, that loan repayment, including the interest that you paid on it, went by, right back into the account. So at the time of my, my retirement, when I withdraw the funds, um, uh, that interest will be included into that into that figure. That's exactly right, and then you'll pay tax on it as it comes out. Yeah, it's uh, it was uh, uh, taxable income. Yes, that was my question, um, and because I was concerned, somebody had told me that no, you don't pay tax in, interest to yourself. That goes. They say that they they go somewhere else, you know, the government or I don't know who they told me. So I was just. <laughs> I just wanted to clear that out. Yes, no problem. No, it's a good question. A lot of folks are confused by that because it, it is confusing that you think about paying a loan to yourself, and yet that's how it works with a 401k. So we appreciate you asking that. Well, folks, we're going to take our quick break. When we come back, we have some lines open as well, 800-525-7000. If you have a financial question today, here's my heart. My desire is for you to be encouraged and equipped to be that wise and faithful steward, living according to biblical wisdom in your financial life, and we want to help you do that. Give us a call today, and we'll do that together. Stay with us. This is Faith and Finance. Many in the Middle East are going through horrific circumstances and are seeking refuge in Lebanon. Heart for Lebanon is bringing them hope, and now you can help. We endured shelling and hunger. We witnessed death everywhere. $116 brings emergency supplies and the hope that only comes through the gospel. I want to spend the rest of my life telling people about Jesus and his salvation. Give now at faithfi.com slash Lebanon or call 888-201-5577. We are grateful for support from Sound Mind Investing in the Faith and Finance Program. If you have money in a retirement account or just a general investing account, you know the stock market can sometimes seem like a roller coaster. But it is possible to enjoy both profit and peace of mind in investing, no matter what's happening in the market. You can see a short video webinar on that topic at soundmindinvesting.org. Since 1990, Sound Mind Investing has sought to offer financial wisdom for living well. Soundmindinvesting.org. Welcome back to Faith and Finance. I'm Rob West. We're taking your calls and questions here in our final segment today. Uh, let's go right back to the phones to Chattanooga. Hi, Lisa. How can I help? So my question real quick is that um, my husband and I sat down with some people last night uh, to discuss getting a roof put on the house. Yeah. yeah. And they wanted 25000 for it. Our, our house, we're out of debt. Our house is paid for. Our cars are paid for. And we uh, we had an emergency fund, but we used it to repair some cars. So that kind of dwindled down to not much. But I can actually make payments on that roof for probably a couple thousand every month. Mm -hmm. So is it wiser to wait and save all the money I can and then maybe pay a uh, take out a very small amount of money or go ahead and get, um, and I don't even know what kind of loan to get. You know, I think you said before, don't do home equity loans because they put a lien on your house. So do something else. So that yeah. was the other part of the question. If I did do it, what kind of loan would you recommend? Um, yeah. For, I think I told you it was twenty five thousand. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't. We're kind of confused. I'm torn on. I don't want to get in debt again. I do yeah. not want to. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's a good feeling because that means, Lisa, if you have to take out a loan because this is something you can't wait on at either now or in the future, uh, you know, then you're going to have a lot of incentive to get it paid off as quick as you can. And that's a good thing. Uh, so a couple of thoughts. Number one is that's a, you know, that's an expensive roof. Now I'm not saying roofs don't cost 25,000 to replace. They do. Uh, and prices are up 
you know, all over the place, including construction and, and certainly with, you know, what it takes to replace a roof. But I would just simply say, let's make sure you get at least three bids um, and get folks competing for your business. Just because when you're talking about a spend like this, you want to make sure that, um, you know, you are getting a fair price. Now, obviously you want somebody who's reputable, who's licensed, who has great reviews, hopefully, you know, who's personally recommended. But I think getting more than one bid for an expense like this is, is very wise. Uh, secondly, in terms of how you pay for it, I mean, obviously if you can put this off, if it's not necessary, it's not going to cause any damage to the home by waiting you know, you uh, delaying this and just taking whatever you have that you'd be paying toward the the debt and starting to set it aside in a in a savings account for this purpose would be great uh, because that would do a couple of things. Number one is it would allow you to borrow as little as possible because you'd be saving. And then secondly, you know, we're seeing some, uh, you know, some improvements in construction costs. And then thirdly, you'd give it some time for interest rates to come down. Now, once you decide you can't wait anymore, I do think, at least in this environment, a home equity line of credit makes sense. Why? Well, normally I don't like home equity lines of credit because they're a variable rate, but with rates up as high as they are now, that it would actually work in your favor because as rates come down, that variable rate, which is usually prime plus something as the Fed funds rate drops, uh, then that rate on that home equity line of credit would come down with the the rates that are being dropped by the Federal Reserve. And so even though you are putting your home up as collateral, it's a very small loan. As long as you feel like you have high confidence that it fits in your budget, then, you know, that's going to be the the cheapest source of funds for you to access. Does all that make sense, though? All of it does, yeah. And I, my, my struggle was, you know, I, I can hear Dave Ramsey saying, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and that from, from his class that we took, he said, if you don't yeah. have the cash to pay for something, you don't get. But, but what if, you know, what if damage does come to the house? Then you got a pro- bigger problem that's going to cost more to fix in the end. Yeah. So I just well, started- I mean, I would, I would echo what you're saying uh, about Dave. I mean, I would say if you don't have to do it, don't do it and let's save and pay with cash. But when it comes to a roof, you may not have that choice. Now, that's where getting, I think, a couple of maybe two, even three reputable roofing contractors in there to tell you, you know, can we do a small patch job on a portion of the roof that's damaged? and wait it out. Do we even need to do that? Maybe it's fine the way it is. You've not got any leaks. Well, maybe this is just more cosmetic or you just know it's nearing the end of its useful life, but you don't have any issues with it. Well, if that's the case, then wait. There's no reason to borrow when you don't have to. But if you've got you know a situation where it's letting water in or it's going to cause damage to the home, then you just don't have a choice because uh, you waiting and not borrowing could result in tens of thousands of dollars in repairs because of damage with water. So you, you just have to be wise about it. And that's why getting a couple of, you know, two to three contractors in there to help you make that decision, I think will be helpful. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for your time, sir. <laughs> You're welcome, Lisa. Thanks for listening to the program and calling today. We appreciate it. Uh, let's see. We're going to uh, quickly go to Coral Springs, Florida. I know it well. Hi, Erica. How can I help? Hi, good um, afternoon. Thank you for taking my call. I have um, a lease um, and it's up next month. And if I decided to buy it, I have to pay 18000 on it. Um, it has 36,000 miles. And I was wondering, is that a good investment? Um, we're trying to have kids, me and my husband, and it's a, a Jeep. It's, you know, fair size. Um, yeah. And then I just also don't want to have any more payments. I don't want to do the payments. So I was just thinking about just paying it outright. What do yeah. you think? Yeah, it's a good question. Do you expect to go over your allotted mileage for the lease, Erica? No. Okay. Mm-mm. All right. Um, so I think if you don't and you're not going to have any fees, then you just need to look at what is the the true value of the car and whether or not you could do better elsewhere uh, by just turning it in and then purchasing a car outright. Uh, the value of used cars has decreased this year. Uh, so you, you know, you might be happy with the current residual value that you pay. You might not be. And so I think you just need to find out exactly 
what is going to be the total cost out the door of you buying this outright with you know 36,000 miles or less versus what it would cost for you to go out and buy a similar car perhaps the exact make and model if you were happy with it um, and and see whether that residual value is at market above market or below market now if it's anywhere close to market the the added benefit of you going ahead and buying it as long as it's been a good car and it's been reliable is you know that it's been taken care of because you've been driving it uh, versus buying another you know car that's three years old where you can get it checked out by an independent mechanic but you don't really have a good feel for how well did they take care of it did they change the oil did they run it hard so i would check edmunds and uh, kbb.com kelly blue book put in the condition the make the model and just find out how the private sale value of a, a used car on the open market compares to what the dealership is going to charge you and then you could also use that as a source of negotiation i hope that helps erica thanks for being on the program today we appreciate it well folks that's going to do it for us thank you to robert gabby t dan and amy couldn't do it without them i'm rob west thanks for listening and sharing and i hope you'll come back and join us again next time for another edition of faith and finance faith and finance is provided by faith by and listeners like you